Uh, the U.S. inflation rate has fluctuated erratically since the onset of the pandemic, and that's led to a big debate about whether movements in inflation are transitory or permanent. And there's a great interest in trying to identify what the underlying trend or core level of inflation is um, once we filter out transitory fluctuations. And I'm going to describe some work on that topic that I've done with co-authors at the IMF. Okay, here's the background, which most uh, viewers of this video will be familiar with. Um, these graphs show the headline inflation rate in the consumer price index since the beginning of 2020. And uh, for each month, the graph on the left shows the monthly CPI inflation rate at an annualized uh, level. And the graph on the right shows uh, for each month inflation over the previous 12 months, which is a statistic which is commonly cited in the media when people analyze inflation. Uh, if we look at the monthly data on the left, we can see quite erratic fluctuations in the headline inflation rate. At the start of the pandemic in April, <clears throat> the, the inflation rate plunged to negative 8%, and then it jumped up over the following two months and then fell again and then jumped all the way up to 10% last summer and back down and up and so on. When we look at the 12 month rates, the monthly fluctuations get smoothed out somewhat, uh, but still there have been uh, dramatic movements compared uh, to the recent past. For uh, the two decades uh, before 2020, uh, the inflation rate stayed pretty consistently, not far from the Fed's 2% target. Uh, and here we have seen very big uh, deviations. And of course, uh, toward the end of 2021, the upward jumps out, started outweighing the downward jumps. And if we look at the 12 month average, uh, as of November, uh, 2021, uh, the last month uh, of data available as I speak, uh, the 12 month inflation rate was 6.9%. And that's a level which is higher than anything seen since the 1980s, and that has obviously alarmed many observers that we have a big inflation problem. Now, these inflation movements have partly reflected developments in the overall economy, but they've also been strongly affected by unusual events in specific industries, and this has gotten a lot of attention. So at the beginning of the pandemics, the, the, the downward plunge in inflation had a lot to do with huge price decreases in pandemic-related uh, industries like travel, um, and a, there was a big spike in used car prices last summer, which caused a big uh, increase in the inflation rate uh, and so on. There have also been big ups and downs in clothing prices, the prices of financial services uh, and other industries. Okay, here's where the concept of core inflation comes in. Economists tend to think that inflation movements resulting from big price changes in specific industries are transitory. So in April 2020, when the inflation rate went down to minus 8%, we didn't think we were moving permanently to deflation. Um, so this has led economists to try to develop measures of underlying or core inflation that filter out the transitory effects of shocks to certain industries and um, give a more stable measure of inflation and one which is arguably a better predictor uh, of where inflation is heading in the future than just the current uh, headline inflation rate. Um, and so what my co-authors and I are interested in is how can we measure core inflation uh, in this episode? Now, the concept of core inflation is not at all new. It dates back to the 1970s, which of course was an era of high and extremely volatile inflation. And the method that was developed in the 1970s for estimating core inflation was very simple. It was just to exclude the prices of food and energy when computing inflation rates. And that was a successful way of filtering out uh, unusual shocks to inflation because in the 1970s, the industries that had big price changes were food and energy industries. So inflation, excluding food and energy, gave a relatively stable measure of core inflation in the 1970s, and actually has continued to be successful uh, from the 1970s all the way up till February 2020, 
uh, the inflation rate excluding food and energy was quite a bit more stable than the headline inflation rate and evidence that it was a good measure of core inflation. Okay, here's the, here's the problem. Uh, the success of the Fed's core inflation measure, inflation excluding food and energy, has broken down in the last two years. Uh, so here we have the headline inflation rate in blue, inflation excluding food and energy in red, and ex excluding food and energy is almost as volatile as the headline inflation rate. So the Fed's measure of core inflation has actually quite closely followed the ups and the erratic ups and downs in headline inflation, with some exception the last two or three months when um, the core measure has filtered out the effects of rising energy prices. So the Fed's measure of core has not risen as much as headline inflation. But still, all in all, um, over the last two years, um, if we think a core measure of inflation should filter out short run fluctuations in headline, uh, the Fed's measure has not been very successful. Now, this graph illustrates why the Fed's measure has not been very successful. So here we're looking at the example of one month, uh, April 2021. And this is an interesting month because it's a month when the headline inflation rate spiked up to about 10%. It was the beginning of a run of several months of high inflation that led to the outbreak of substantial concerns about inflation uh, last summer. So for April 2020, the graph is a histogram of industry inflation rates. It shows what fraction of industries weighted by the importance of industries in the economy had inflation rates in different ranges. And we can see a couple of things. Uh, first of all, in most industries, nothing dramatic happened. So there are a lot of industries with inflation rates clustered around zero. But also, quite clearly, there's a big skewness in the distribution. There's a big tail of industries with inflation rates uh, that were very high. Notice, by the way, the numbers on the horizontal axis are not annualized. So 10% inflation in a month is well over 100% at an annualized rate. Um, so there are probably no surprises in what industries had uh, big inflation rates. So the famous used cars shows up. Uh, car rental prices had an even big increase, uh, although that's a much smaller part of the economy uh, than used cars. Um, now, and, and the key point is that the uh, industries in the tails are not food and energy. So the industries in red are the food and ener energy industries. Uh, nothing special happened in those industries. So if you filter out the effects of food and energy prices, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, food and energy inflation, uh, inflation excluding food and energy for this month was about 10%, the same as headline inflation. Um, okay. Um, all right, now this is probably not news that used car prices went up a lot and that affected inflation. Um, this kind of pattern has led some people to do ad hoc adjustments to the inflation rate to try to reduce the effects of outliers. So people in the media compute inflation rates excluding used car prices. Some people go a little further and have inflation excluding the prices of any auto related uh, uh, goods or services. So you get rid of used car uh, of uh, car rental prices uh, as well. Um, other people have made lists of industries that have been strongly affected by COVID and said, let's exclude the prices uh, in all these industries to get a measure of core inflation. Fed officials have sometimes gone so far as to say, let's get rid of all the prices of goods, which can be affected by supply chain problems, and just look at, at the prices of services as a measure of core inflation. And all of these different approaches take out some of the big price increases and give you a lower inflation rate. We think, however, that this is not the ideal measure, ideal way to measure core inflation. For one thing, it's complicated to keep track of all the prices in different industries and to decide each month which prices we exclude from our inflation measure, which prices should we include. Also, this kind of ad hoc way of taking out certain prices is subject to abuse. 
Uh, in every month, there are some industries with higher price increases than other industries. And if you're out to make the inflation rate look lower, you can take out the prices of whichever industries have the highest inflation rates. For that matter, if you want to make the inflation rate look higher, you can take out the prices of industries with the lowest inflation rates. So what we would like to have is some approach that effectively filters out crazy fluctuations in used car prices or whatever else are, are outliers in the distribution, but which does so in a simple way that's easy to implement and doesn't require subjective judgments about which industries to include or exclude. Fortunately, uh, such methods exist, and in fact have existed for quite a while. So what we want to advocate is a good way of measuring core inflation is what we call outlier exclusion measures of core. Arguably the simplest of these is the Cleveland Fed's weighted median uh, inflation rate. And this is actually quite old. It was developed in the 1990s. Uh, and we think uh, that this measure should have been getting more attention for, for quite a while. And the basic idea of the Cleveland Fed uh, measure it is just to use a median, or in other words, if you look at the histogram, look at the midpoint of the distribution of industry inflation rates. Um, and uh, that gets rid of the effects of outliers. If you have an industry uh, which has a higher inflation rate than the median, if you move it you know, way out uh, to a very, very high inflation rate, that doesn't affect the median. So a median is an effective way of filtering out outliers. Um, and it does it very simply and automatically. Now, another version of the outlier exclusion class of core measures, which has gotten some attention, is the Dallas Fed's uh, trimmed mean, which it applies to the peak personal consumption expenditure deflator measure of inflation, which is something the Fed likes to focus on. Uh, the Dallas Fed doesn't just look at the median, it takes the histogram and it chops off uh, the top 24% of the uh, inflation rates and the bottom 31% of the inflation rates, which is a different way of making sure that what's ever way out in the tails uh, gets, uh, gets removed. Um, now, uh, in practice, these two measures uh, are quite similar. There are esoteric issues about the pros and cons of trim means versus medians and why the Dallas Fed cuts off different amounts from the top and the bottom of the distribution, but I won't get into that right now. Uh, the bottom line is that both of these methods and other variations on these methods uh, are quite effective at removing the biggest uh, price changes um, and isolating uh, a stable measure of core inflation. Even before the pandemic, uh, there was considerable research on um, uh, measures of core inflation that found that these measures were less volatile um, than uh, XFE inflation, inflation excluding food and energy, uh, and also more closely related to economic slack. Uh, the, the economic theory, the Phillips curve, says that core inflation should be related to economic slack, and there's evidence that these outlier exclusion measures uh, have that property. Now, in fact, uh, the Bank of Canada uh, in revising its monetary framework periodically, did a lot of research with Canadian data on different measures of core inflation. And in 2016, uh, the Bank of Canada officially decided to get rid of their previous measure of core inflation, uh, which was quite similar to inflation excluding food and energy, and instead to adopt a weighted median and a trimmed mean uh, as their primary measures of core inflation. So that's Canada. In the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve is still using a 1970s era measure of core inflation, uh, inflation excluding, excluding food and energy, which was effective at filtering out um, uh, big industry price changes in the past, but not in the last two years. So, uh, so we think there's been, been evidence for a while that there's a case for moving towards the weighted median or trim mean is measures of core inflation. Um, but that evidence we think has become much stronger in the last two years because uh, our preferred measures have been quite a bit more stable than inflation excluding food and energy. 
uh, which is shown uh, in this uh, picture. So in this graph, um, again, we have monthly inflation rates annualized on the left and 12 month inflation rates on the right. We again have the headline inflation rate, but now we compare it to the Cleveland Fed's weighted median. And again, whether you look at a weighted median or a trimmed mean doesn't matter very much for this kind of picture. And what we see here is that even at, at the monthly level, um, the, the black line, the weighted median, effectively filters out the erratic ups and downs in the headline rate. So we do not get a plunge in inflation in April 2020. We do not get the big upward spikes um, last summer. Um, if we look at the 12 month inflation rate, the weighted median uh, is very smooth. It changes very little month to month. It changes somewhat over time, but those changes make sense from the point of view of macroeconomics. Uh, and in particular, from the point of view of the Phillips curve that says core inflation should be related to economic slack. So basically what happened is that in 2020, when the economy was weak, core inflation is measured by the weighted median drifted downward. Uh, and more recently in 2021, uh, we've seen uh, a rise in core inflation, which is what one would expect given the economic recovery and the fact that we have a very tight labor market uh, with a very high level of job openings. So overall, uh, the weighted median has performed well, we think, as a measure of core inflation. Now, finally, if one accepts the idea that this kind of outlier exclusion measure is a good measure of core inflation, that has some implications for interpreting uh, where we are right now. So again, let's look at the latest available data, 12 months inflation as of November, 2021. Again, it, it's pretty alarming if we look at headline inflation, either for the CPI or for the PCE deflator. It is not so alarming if we look at the current level of the median CPI inflation rate, or the Dallas Fed's trimmed mean uh, for the PCE deflator inflation rate. So median CPI is 3.5%. It was just about 3.0% on the eve of the pandemic. So not that much higher. Um, a PCE deflator inflation rate of 2.8% uh, is not alarming. Uh, the Fed has said that it wants to overshoot its long run and target of, of 2% somewhat. Um, to make up for the fact that inflation was below 2% for a long time after the 2008 financial crisis. So maybe 2.8% is not that far off from what the Fed would like. Now, I do want to qualify that uh, and say how alarmed we should be with inflation depends on whether we look at the snapshot of where we are right now or whether we look at the direction where we're heading. So again, going back to the graph, if we look at the black line on the right, the level is not too high, but it's he heading in an upward direction. So if it continues to head in an upward direction for a few more months, uh, the inflation situation will get more and more alarming. So, so in the end, I am definitely not gonna prognosticate about where inflation is heading in the future. That has worked out badly for me in the past, as well as for other people in the past. Uh, so I'm going to retreat to the safe position that we need to carefully watch incoming data to see what happens to inflation. You know, the one less vacuous thing I'll say is that in watching uh, incoming data, we should focus on the Cleveland Fed median inflation rate and the Dallas Fed trim mean inflation rate as good indicators of what's happening to inflation and not pay so much attention uh, to the more widely reported headline inflation rate and um, inflation made excluding food and energy.